Welcome to the 2021 State of the University Address. I am Greg Lyman, Chair of the Faculty Senate for this academic year. I have the privilege this year of introducing our new president, Dr. Jim Wolpart. During the past few months, I have had the pleasure of working with President Wolpart, who has already proven himself to be an engaged and enthusiastic leader for our university. I've appreciated his willingness to listen, to hear divergent opinions, to ask questions, and to challenge the status quo in ways that encourage new thinking and innovation while also respecting our rich history and traditions. His commitment to developing a culture of shared leadership and shared responsibility are already apparent in his actions, which have included the creation of the COVID-19 Fall 2021 Planning Committee and Task Force and the, st the Steering Committee developing a new vision, mission, and strategic plan for the university. With each of those groups, he has made a deliberate choice to include representatives from a wide range of university constituencies. It is only through such frameworks that we can gather around shared values and a common vision. We have many challenges and opportunities facing us in the coming months and years. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to hinder our efforts to return to a more normal pre-pandemic way of living and learning. And has also impact, had an impact on our enrollment which will continue to be felt for years to come. We will need President Wolpart's leadership and direction as we move forward. President Wolpart comes to us from Northern Iowa University where he served as interim president for nearly a year and as provost and executive vice president for academic affairs for more than five years. He led more than 450 full-time faculty as well as 150 part-time faculty and 300 staff members. At Northern Iowa, and before that at Florida Gulf Coast University, President Wolpart championed collaboration and teamwork. He built strong leadership teams that had remarkable success in areas including sustainability, enrollment, strategic marketing, and retention and persistence. He helped to build pipelines, particularly for people of color, to achieve greater equity and inclusion. With more than 25 years of experience in higher education leadership, President Wolpart has served as a department chair, an associate dean, a dean, a provost, and a president. Throughout his career, he has demonstrated a belief in the transformative power of higher, higher education, especially through applied learning experiences, service learning, and community engagement. I'm excited about what lies ahead. The transition from one leader to another offers, offers opportunity for renewal, reflection, and re-engagement. I'm looking forward to working with President Wolpart as we refresh the vision and direction of our university. Now, please join me in welcoming the 15th president of Central Washington University, Jim Wolpart, for his first State of the University Address. Thank you, Faculty Chair Lyman. I appreciate that very kind introduction. And thank you to all of you who have gathered this morning in the concert hall and for all of you who are watching as this presentation is being live streamed. Those people who have gathered today include leadership from all employee groups, faculty senate, union leadership, student leadership, deans and department heads, residence hall advisors. We have community members in the hall. Thank you to our two county commissioners, Gladys, uh, Laura Ashadis and Corey Wright, they've come also to represent the community, which is such an important part of our vision and mission going forward. I'll talk about that. Um, along with the executive leadership team and their leadership teams, and we do have a trustee in the house, trustee Gladys Gillis is with us today too, so thank you for coming. We've also invited members of the three steering committees that are guiding important work and I will talk about those groups as we move forward. I cannot wait until we can welcome the entire community back for these types of gatherings so that we can all be together to celebrate. We should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which Central Washington University resides. It is the historic home of the Yakima people, 
the federally recognized confederated tribes and bands of the Yakama Nation is made up of the Klickitat, Palouse, Walla Walla, Wanapum, Wenatchee, Wishram, and Yakima people. The Yakima people remain committed stewards of this land, cherishing it and protecting it, as instructed by elders through the generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. We give thanks to the legacy of the original people, their lives, and their descendants. I read this statement as a reminder that the land is not owned. It is rather a gift that is inherited. In taking responsibility for that gift, we must think of the seven generations, of how we will pass this gift forward and create a legacy worthy of our inheritance. Cristina Torres Garcia, who is the director of El Centro, recently reminded us that reading this statement should disrupt our usual ways of thinking and being in the world, our epistemology and our ontology, to help us think beyond ourselves to something bigger. This new way of thinking and being will be a theme of my talk and indeed of my work as president. I'd like to start and end today with a personal story about my father which will frame my comments. My father had a very profound effect on my life and on my values and my role as a faculty member and an administrator. So this is a shout out to my father and to all fathers, including my father-in-law, Dennis Linson, who is watching today. One of the few benefits that we've gained from enduring what we've endured over the last 20 months is our ability to connect through the internet. So I also want to give a shout out to my mother, Pam Wolpart, who's watching, along with hopefully my siblings. We'll find out which one of them tuned in. And to all mothers, including my mother-in-law, Linda Linson, and my stepmother-in-law, Amy Linson, I must say I am blessed with remarkable women who guide my life. And that includes my partner, Sasha Linson Wolpart, who has joined us today. As some of you know, my father passed away from cancer just a little over a year ago after a very long and valiant battle. About four years ago, I made the trek from Iowa down to Tennessee to visit my father and spend some time with him. When I arrived at his home in Oak Ridge, he told me he had made reservations at the Snowbird Mountain Lodge, which was his favorite place to go up in the Smoky Mountains. On the day of the reservations, he asked me to drive, which was very unusual for my father to turn over the steering wheel but I could tell that his cancer had progressed and he didn't have the focus or the energy to be behind the wheel. We drove the Cherahola Skyway across the Tennessee mountains and into North Carolina. Along the way, scenic pullouts, those brown signs that you see along the way for state parks, scenic pullouts were marked with brown signs sporting an image of a camera. As we passed each pullout, my father said quizzically, I wonder why they sell cameras up here. At the next one, look at that, cameras for sale. At one pullout that awful also offered picnicking, he declared picnic sale tables for sale too. Now I have to say my father was not experiencing dementia. This dry sense of humor was how he operated his entire life. About two thirds of the way up the Cherahola Skyway, we passed what looked like two telephone poles on opposite sides of each other and at the top of each pole, a five foot long plank stood out from the edges, leaving a gap of about 20 feet across those planks. And I wondered out loud, what are these poles for? And my father said, flying squirrels. Now I'll tell you, in our family, there are two different ways of interacting with my father's dry sense of humor. My kids, uh, my siblings and I would just ignore him or go along with it and play along. My mother, on the other hand, believed every word he said and tried to correct him so that he would understand the errors of his way. So when my father said flying squirrels, I responded, right, flying squirrels, and I drove on. My father and I always talked about work. He had been a professor and department head of biology at Kenyon College, so he took a keen interest in my professional life. At one point, he had been offered a presidency of a liberal arts college out here in the state of Washington, but he turned it down because of what he thought would be a major disruption to the family. I found this out years later. I was livid. 
We could have been living in Washington after all. He would be so proud of where I have landed and of all the work that you all do with our students. Over the last four months that I've been at Central Washington University and the six months before that during my transition, I've done a lot of listening to faculty, to staff, to students, to our administrative teams, to alumni, to donors, to individuals in the Ellensburg community and beyond, including faculty and staff at our university centers, which I've been able to visit. I keep hearing the same thing over and over. Central Washington University is a special place because it provides a transformative life experience for our students. The faculty and staff, both inside and outside the classroom, care deeply for students, getting to know them and assisting them on their journey. In the classroom, the self-exploration necessary for this transformative experience occurs through classes that provide the knowledge and skills necessary for professional preparation, civic agency, and a life of curiosity and wonder. Outside the classroom, this learning is then deepened through solving real-world prob problems in real-world settings, service learning, internships, undergraduate research, community engagement, and other high-impact practices. Those practices make such a difference, and they operate at a very high level here. Because of our focus on access, we offer this transformative experience to a wide array of students, from a range of socioeconomic backgrounds, racial and ethnic groups, students from rural and urban settings, and this emphasis on access and diversity makes this university special and distinct, and we need to honor that. We are the most diverse four-year public university in the state of Washington. That's awesome. As a result, we have an opportunity before us as an institution, but we also have a great responsibility to take our work to the next level. Given the impact of what you do, we must consider ways in which we can broaden our reach and deepen our commitment. And so I will take the rest of this talk to share my thoughts on the state of Central Washington University and the efforts we will make together to transition from a truly good institution, making such a remarkable difference, to a great institution that takes up the responsibilities before us. I've got four thoughts that I'll share. First, to elevate shared governance and shared leadership. As I consider the work we have before us to deepen our ability to work together in governing this university, I consider three elements. First, we must act in ways that are both collaborative and inclusive. And this is a challenge. It's easy to collaborate with a small group of like-minded people. It's easy to be inclusive and bring a bunch of people in the room, but then not necessarily listen to all their voices. To balance these two, to be both collaborative and inclusive, is the work of democracy. It is messy, it is hard, and it takes practice. Second, we must find meaningful ways to share information that is relevant and allows for participation in decision making. That is, to be transparent in ways that inform members of the university community so that they can participate in governance. This may mean shifting our current arrangements where sometimes every meeting is live streamed to the world and people don't necessarily engage in the hard work of disagreement and collaboration. Can we get to a place where we can be openly honest and disagree with each other, where we can challenge each other and disrupt the status quo? And then third, the third element of shared governance is to be data informed, but not data driven. We must remember that behind every data point is a human being, an important program or project with some context and history that must be honored. Data should inform, but not drive our decisions. Now, I do recognize that developing good data systems here at Central that are accurate and reliable and have integrity is the first step in this process. We will be working to enhance the Office of Institutional Effectiveness. They've done fantastic work. We'll take, we will take this work to the next level um, so that the community can have the data we need to inform the decisions going forward. They need to be empowered to lead this work. As we elevate shared governance together, we must recognize the responsibility we have to share our voice and our perspective 
while balancing that responsibility with what I call institutional thinking, remembering that our decisions must be grounded in doing what is best for the university as a whole. As you know, one example of this new shared governance model was used in the fall 2021 committee and task force, which included membership from all employee groups, faculty, classified staff, exempt staff, administrators, and students. I asked each member to bring perspectives from their area to these meetings and to listen to other perspectives. This is the truly hard work of shared governance and of democracy to balance representing your area, your interests, your perspectives, and those perspectives of your constituents with authentic listening to the voices of other areas. And I asked this group to work through a consensus model. It's so easy to devolve to voting and seeing who has the majority. Recognizing that in a consensus model, not everyone will agree with the final result, but the conversation leads to a general view shared by most. I truly appreciate the hard work that this group did and Dean Greg Heinzelman and Associate Provost Gail Mackin's leadership. Let's give them a round of applause. Many of them are here today. As much as the end result of their work is important for this institution, the process is also important because we're learning how to think and be in new and different ways. And I do want to pause for a moment and acknowledge the stress that we've been under for the last 20 months, caring for our families, caring for each other, caring for ourselves. We've lost so much and missed so much, birthdays and funerals and weddings. Uh, our Office of Human Resources and Student Wellness have provided great leadership over the last couple of months. Um, getting us to the place where we are now where 93% of our campus is vaccinated and we're able to determine that. And the communication that has gone out has been just stellar. I know too that we're not done yet. We're sitting together spaced out with masks on. We must continue to elevate our care and compassion and our grace and take this work to the next level. So thank you all for what we have done over the last 20 months. We still have work to do. And as we think about taking our work to the next level, I will ask, you'll hear this theme several times today, can we expand this type of collaborative interaction with the Ellensburg community and the Kittitas Valley? Can we weave our work together as one entity, making decisions that will improve the lives of everyone living in this area, recognizing that we will have different perspectives and points of view? Can we find a common thread that will knit us together as we take our community to the next level. All right, second point. To be guided by a clear and inspirational vision and mission and a well thought out strategic plan. As you know, we're using a similar shared governance model to develop a new vision and mission and strategic plan. And I do wanna read the definition of a vision and a mission that the committee came up with because um, when you get to see drafts, which will be a little while, given the overwhelming response we had, we expected two or 300 responses. We had 712 that this committee needs to go through. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? Wow. This will be a vision and mission and strategic plan that we will all own because of that participation. So when you get to read it, I want you to remember these words. These are profound words. Our vision statement will be an aspirational, memorable, future-oriented statement that is big and bold enough to propel the university forward. It should inspire the members of the institution to strive for their dream and constituencies outside the institution to support that dream. Our mission statement will capture the university's core purpose and inspire the consistent, high quality, and intentional actions by which the vision will be achieved. It will guide strategic plan and planning and decision making. I want to thank members of the Vision, Mission, Strategic Plan Steering Committee for their deep commitment to thinking institutionally and lifting up the voices of the university community and our local community of supporters. I do want you to remember that they are facilitators of your voice. Your participation matters. Let's give them a round of applause. They have so much work ahead of them. The strategic plan that will be developed as a community will provide a blueprint for how we will achieve our vision. It will guide all decision making, budget allocations and reallocations, new program development personnel. I won't stand up here 
every year and give you a new set of goals and targets. That'll be our target, and those are the things we will be working towards. And it must have, as a central focus, student engagement and student success. That is centrally what we are about. Indeed, several initiatives are already underway as we invest in student su success right now in the short term to make certain that our long-term future is, is strong. Uh, I'll, I'll mention a few. Creating a seamless and integrated effort for recruitment, retention, and persistence and graduation of both new first-year students and transfer students. And we're developing stronger partnerships with our centers to create seamless pathways from our centers into the institution. Elevating our marketing connected to recruitment, which will include an overhaul of our website. Um, boy, when I go to our website and look stuff up, there's broken links. I can't imagine being a 17 or 18 year old trying to find information. We gotta, the website needs to be about recruiting students. We've got to get there. Developing a stronger brand presence across the state and creating a culture of philanthropy and elevating our fundraising efforts. I want to be clear that these will be investments that we need to make now that will ensure our long-term thriving. As we position ourselves for long-term success, we must consider how we are distinct as an institution of higher education. In the listening I've done, two elements have surfaced time and again, and these also show up in the survey over and over again. This feedback is very much in line with research on the future of higher education and especially the preparation of students for the world of work and, and of civic agency over the next 10 to 20 years. So two things. First, I've heard very strong support for becoming an equity-focused institution. Indeed, that was one of the things that drew me here. That was part of what came out of the Board of Trustees listening sessions as they prepared to hire a new president. Recognizing that over 40% of our student population comes from groups representing diverse races and ethnicities and backgrounds, we have the opportunity to create a culture of belonging as a foundation for welcoming these students into our community, both on our various campuses and in the local community. We can work to develop what Django Paris calls culturally sustaining programs, projects, and initiatives so that we recognize, honor, and indeed sustain the histories, literacies, languages, communities, and cultures of the diverse individuals who make up our community. As you know, we've launched a self-reflective process to analyze our work using the University of Southern California's equity scorecard. This process will provide us an honest and authentic accounting of where we are with the support and success of our traditionally underrepresented students, faculty, and staff and then to create an action plan to build on our strengths and address our shortcomings. I wanna thank the committee that has come together to guide this work and the co-leaders, John Vasquez, Associate Dean for Access and Equity, and Sigrid Davison, Associate Director of Diversity and Inclusion. Let's please thank this amazing group. Second, I have heard about and studies demonstrate the importance of high impact practices, including especially engaged learning experiences. To take this work to the next level at Central, we might heed surveys of employers from recent years which more strongly emphasize the need for institutions of higher education to focus on intercultural literacy, the ability to communicate and collaborate with individuals from different backgrounds and perspectives in engaging and solving real-world problems. This might be a niche for Central Washington University, a place where we could become a model in the Pacific Northwest and perhaps the nation to create engaged learning experiences with a special focus on bringing individuals with diverse backgrounds together. And if we could do this work of developing high-impact practices in intentional and developmental ways, call it the Wildcat Experience, we could truly stand out from what other institutions do. Rather than having pockets of these experiences that students might move through, they might encounter, we could thoughtfully and intentionally create these experiences connected to the curriculum that they must move through in their time with us. And then I'm gonna ask again, can we connect this work to the work of our local community? We must always be asking ourselves, how do we as a university serve the community in which we are embedded? Can we develop a service learning institute to integrate community engagement and specific courses, partnering with nonprofits on meeting their needs? 
Can we work with the business community to develop a professional readiness program that prepares our students for internships so that when they join a local business for that internship, they're ready to add value on day one and then hopefully stay in Ellensburg when they graduate. I remember during my visit with my father in the Smoky Mountains that we talked about the role of faculty in the curriculum in students' lives and the way in which this kind of intentional and developmental series of learning experiences could open possibilities for students and even change the trajectory of their lives. I reminded him of a former student that I had run into in Maine. I was running a workshop, and after the workshop, this uh, individual came up and he said, now Wolpart, that's an unusual name. Any relation to Al Wolpart from Kenyon College? And I said, yes, I'm his son. He told me he had taken a class from my father 30 years earlier that greatly influenced his life. I asked him if he wanted to talk to my father. This was a while ago. I pulled out my flip phone, reached my dad, told him I had a former student on the line, and the student took the phone, went into an alcove, and they had a long conversation filled with philosophical reflection and at the same time uproarious laughter back and forth. When he returned the phone to me, he explained that he had taken a class with my father called Man and Nature, part of an interdisciplinary experience in the foundational curriculum intended to broaden students' understandings of the world, expand their ethics beyond the anthropocentric, and initiate an awareness of interconnections and interrelationships, at once building their capacity for humility and their capability for leading change. The curriculum had been designed in response to the growing awareness in the 1970s of the human impact on the world, the birth of Earth Day, the advent of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, and the beginning of an ecological mindset. My father's former student explained that he was not a science major that he did not take another course with my father, but that this one course offered texture to his entire life. And you all do that too as faculty and as staff. How do we take up this professional responsibility before this, I asked my father, to create curricular and co-curricular experiences that respond to our time, that allow this generation of students to engage the big questions of their era in ways that make explicit the purpose behind the courses that we teach. That indeed offer a sense of coherence and meaning such that students complete their education wanting more, not less. That prepare them not only for professional careers, but also for active citizenship, able and willing to engage diverse perspectives so that we are both more innovative and creative, but also so that we weave the tattered cloth of our civic society back together. And finally, that create a foundation for curiosity and wonder and lifelong learning. All right, third of the four, to embody an ethos of deep care. Like shared governance, deep care is a challenge because it involves a paradox. But paradoxes are, as Parker Palmer tells us, the place where meaningful and purposeful lives are lived. Can we learn to care deeply for individuals, for the people who they are and the people who they are becoming, recognizing that we are all on a journey and at the same time balance this care of individuals with care for the community as a whole? This is the challenge. At the same time that we show care and concern for individuals, we must think institutionally to think beyond our programs, departments, colleges, divisions, to, to what is best for the university as a whole. And then beyond even that, to broaden our thinking out to incorporate the Ellensburg community in Kittitas Valley. Central Washington University cannot be successful without building partnerships and collaborations with our local community and the state. Deep care is not a pass. I mean, it doesn't say that everyone gets to do what they want. As part of deep care, we not only ask everyone to think beyond themselves, we also expect the highest level of quality and excellence in all we do. What we do matters so much. True care is not about keeping the bar low so that everybody can get over it. It's about raising the bar and then providing the support and professional development necessary so that all individuals flourish. And then fourth, to remember the deep purpose of our work. At Central Washington University, we are centrally about transforming the lives of students, 
their families, and their communities. As faculty and staff, you touch the lives of students each and every day, providing a foundation for their journey and shaping the contours of the path ahead. This is a remarkable opportunity, but as I've also said, it's also an important responsibility. We must provide every student who comes to Central Washington University the opportunity to know who they are, to find confidence in that person who they are becoming, and to find a pathway forward into the future that allows them to thrive. I would say the same for all of our faculty and staff, every employee. Our work must focus on student engagement and student success for this transformation to happen. Through meaningful academic programs, curriculum, and pedagogy, through intentional and developmental co-curricular programs, including high-impact practices and engaged learning, and through extracurricular programs that develop the social, emotional, psychological, and spiritual aspects of our students' lives. They are whole people, and we must educate them as whole persons. The deeper purpose of higher education remembers that we are about more than preparing students for careers. We are about so much more than that. We are about preparing them for life, for living full and rich lives imbued with meaning, full of passion for this present moment, knowing that it's the only moment we're ever given. And in that full and complete presence, we live into our purpose, understanding our own gifts and talents and how to offer those gifts and talents to meet the world's needs. And those needs are great at this time. My conversations with my father impressed upon me deeply that the role of higher education is to assist all of us in engaging the pressing issues of our present moment. And you've heard me say this before, we have three before us that we must take on if the teaching and learning experience is really relevant for our students. They are climate change that's rocking our planet, creating extreme heat waves, drought, and fire. Racial injustice that has led to demonstrations across the country and on many university campuses over the last few years. And the polarization of our democracy and our civic society. The inability of individuals with different political views to have a civil exchange, listen to each other, and work towards a constructive solution to the problems we face. How can we become a model for working together across our differences to engage these challenges? not just at the university, but out into the community. This work will take open minds and open hearts. It will take building bridges and building relationships. And everyone will have a role to play as our work moves to this next level. We can't do this work in silos. We must come together as a community to learn to be hosts and facilitate diverse perspectives to be leaders in place. If we can remember that we are centrally about educating the whole person, the intellectual, the social emotional, the psychological, the spiritual, we must also remember that we are one institution and one community made up of rich and diverse perspectives and that creativity and innovation come from honoring our diversity even while we remember our wholeness. When my father and I left Snowbird Lodge, we drove to Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest. And within this ecosystem stands the largest number of trees, they were tulip poplars in this case, over 130 feet high and 15 feet in diameter than anywhere else in the eastern United States. It's a remarkable and sacred place. We were alone in the forest that morning, which was very unusual, as we slowly walked up the path, my father's laborious breathing, a remnant of a recent radiation treatment. At each of the poplars close by the pass, we paused and together leaned into the trees, feeling their cool bark, soothed by their ancient spirits. We passed a nurse log, an ancient tree that had fallen to the ground, dead but sprouting new life. He stood by the log and wondered in awe at the way in which the old beget the new, how life passes on to life, how we live in a great circle. In that moment, as we stood together in Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest, alone but embraced by something much bigger, much grander than our own lives, I felt the way in which my father's deep sadness at his own mortality 
was imbued with an awareness that his life was whole. On the drive back down Cherahola Skyway, I asked my father again about the telephone poles. Flying squirrels, he said. So when we stopped for a short hike up to a bald, I googled Cherahola Skyway and flying squirrels. I learned that the parkway had intersected an endangered population of northern flying squirrels who could not cross the roadway. <laughs> the ingenious design of the flying squirrel posts had allowed for a greater integration of the gene pool and the survival of the population. At that time, my father was 80 years old and full of life, his mind and his heart as sharp as they'd ever been. He had found some magical way to know that his life was attached to something bigger, something so grand that it grounded his daily existence in deep and rich meaning. His impact on students and his work supporting faculty and staff have been a model for me about how to offer my life as a gift to others. Since the onset of his cancer, my father and I engaged in deep conversations about the end of life and what lay beyond, about the transition from this earthly existence to what comes next. He wanted to know, he wanted to be prepared. He wanted to have some sense of where he was going and what was next. But on that trip to the Smoky Mountains that fall, he no longer had those questions. He only talked of his children, his grandchildren, and the gifts that they offer the world. Of his former students, he told so many stories as a faculty member of his students. Even as he became an administrator, he always reflected back to his students. But also of the faculty and staff whose lives he embraced as if they were in family. They were in our home all the time. Of ancient poplars so tall and so majestic and nurse logs that beget life and flying squirrels. Thank you all so much for coming today. Thank you for watching and listening. Thank you for the great work that you do, caring so deeply for our students and for each other. And thank you for believing. Have a great day.